you've talked about quantifying your thinking. We've been talking about this, sort of a game theoretic view on life um, and putting probabilities behind estimates. Like if you think about different trajectories you can take through life, just actually analyzing life in game theoretic way, like your own life, like personal life. Mm -hmm. You, I think you've given an example that you had an honest conversation with Igor about like how long is this relationship gonna last? So similar to our sort of marriage problem kind of discussion, having an honest conversation about the probability of things that we sometimes are a little bit too shy or scared to think of in a probabilistic terms. Can you speak to that kind of way of reasoning, uh, the good and the bad of that? Can, can, can you do this kind of thing with human relations? Yeah, so the... The, the scenario you're talking about, it was like... Yeah, tell me about that scenario. Yeah, uh, I think it was about a year into our relationship um, and we were having a fairly heavy conversation because we were trying to figure out whether or not I was going to sell my apartment. Well, you know, he had already moved in, but I think we were just figuring out what like our long-term plans would be. Should we, should we buy a place together, et cetera? When you guys are having that conversation, are you like drunk out of your mind on wine or is you sober and you're actually having a serious... Like, how, sober. How do you get to that conversation? Because most people are kind of afraid to have that kind of serious conversation. Well, so, uh, you know, our relationship was very... Well, first of all, we were good friends for a couple of years before we even, you know, got, you know, romantic. Yeah. Um, and... When we did get romantic, it was very clear that this was a big deal. It wasn't just like another, like ra you know, it wasn't a random thing. Um, and So the probability of it being a big deal was high. It was already very high. And then we'd been together for a year and it had been pretty golden and wonderful. So, you know, there was a lot of foundation already where we felt very comfortable having a lot of frank conversations. But Igor's... Mo has always been much more than mine. He he was always from the outset like just in a relationship, radical transparency and honesty is the way because the truth is the truth whether you want to hide it or not. You know, where it will come out eventually. And um, it, if you aren't able to accept difficult things yourself, then how could you possibly expect to be like the most integral version? That, you know, you can't. The, re the relationship needs this bedrock of like honesty as a foundation more than anything yeah and that's really interesting but i would like to push against some of those ideas but okay all right but, but that's the down, up. down the line yes throw them up uh i just rudely interrupt no that's fine <laughs> um and so you know we we'd been about together for a year and things were good and we were having this hard conversation and and then he was like well okay what's the likelihood that we're going to be together in three years then because i think it was roughly a three-year time horizon yeah and I was like, oh, oh, interesting. And then we were like, actually, wait, don't, before you say it out loud, let's both write down our predictions formally. Because mm -hmm. um, we'd been like, we were just getting into like effective altruism and rationality at the time, which is all about making, you know, formal predictions as a means of uh, measuring your own, um, well, your, your, your own uh, foresight, essentially, in a quantified way. So we like both wrote down our percentages and we also did a one year uh, prediction and a 10 year one as well. So we got percentages for all three and then we showed each other. Um, and I remember like having this moment of like, Ooh, cause for the 10 year one, I was like, Ooh, well, I mean, I love him a lot, but like a lot can happen in 10 years, you know? And, um, we've only been together for, you know, so I was like, I think it's over 50%, but it's definitely not 90%. And then I remember like wrestling. I was like, oh, but I don't want him to be hurt. I don't want him to, you know, I don't want to give a number lower than his. And I remember thinking, I was like, uh, -uh don't game it. This is an exercise in radical honesty. Mm -hmm. So just give your real percentage. And I think mine was like 75%. And then we showed each other. And luckily, we were fairly well aligned. Um, and <laughs> but honestly, even like if we weren't... 20%. <laughs> huh? I, it, definitely, <laughs> it definitely would have... I If his had been consistently lower than mine, that would have rattled me for sure. Whereas if it had been the other way around, I think he would have, he's just kind of like a water off the d a duck's back type of guy. He'd be like, okay, well, all right, we'll figure this out. Well, uh, did you guys provide air bars on the estimate? Like the level of They came built in. We didn't give formal plus or minus error bars. I didn't draw any or anything like that. Well, the, the, I guess that's the question I have is, did you feel informed enough to make such decisions? Because like, I feel like if you were, if I were to do this kind of thing rigorously, mm. I would want some data. Uh, I, I would want to sort of, one of the assumptions you have is you're not that different from other relationships. Right. And so 
I want to I want to have some data about the you way want the base rates. Yeah, and and also actual trajectories of relationships. I would love to have um, like time series data about the ways that relationships fall apart or prosper, uh, how they collide with different life events, losses, job changes, moving. Uh, both partners find jobs. The one, only one has a job. I want that kind of data mm -hmm. and how often the different trajectories change in life. Like how rep, how informative is your past to your future? That's a whole thing. Like, I, can you look at my life and have a good prediction about in terms of my characteristics of my relationships of what that's gonna look like in the future or not? I don't even know the answer to that question. I'll be very ill-informed in terms of making the probability. I would be far, yeah, I, I, I just would be under-informed. I would be under-informed. I'll be over-biasing to my prior experiences, I think. Right, but as long as you're aware of that and you're honest with yourself, I still and, and you're honest with the other person, say, look, I have really wide error bars on this for the following reasons. Yeah. That's okay. I still think it's better than not trying to quantify it at all if you're trying to make really major, irreversible life decisions. And I feel also the romantic nature of that question. For me personally, I would, I, I try to live my life thinking it's very close to 100%. Like allowing myself actually the, this is, this is the difficulty of this, is allowing myself to think differently, I feel like has a psychological consequence. That's where that that's what's one of my pushbacks against radical honesty is uh this one one particular perspective on so, so you're saying you would you would rather give a falsely high percentage to your partner going back to uh, uh the, the in order the, to the, sort the of wise create sage this additional film. optimism Helmuth. yes of uh, <laughs> uh fake it till you make it the, the positive the power positivity. of positive thinking. hashtag positivity yeah, yeah. hashtag um with the hashtag <laughs> Well, so that, and this comes back to this idea of useful fictions, yeah, right? And I, I, I agree. I don't think there's a clear answer to this, and I think it's actually quite subjective. Some people this works better for than others. Yeah. Um, you know, to be clear, Igor and I weren't doing this f formal prediction in it. Like we, we did it with very much tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like we were going to make, I don't think it even would have drastically changed what we decided to do even. We kind of just did it more as a fun exercise. Um, but the consequence of that fun exercise, you really actually kind of, there was a deep honesty to it too. Exactly. It was a deep, and it was, yeah, it was just like this moment of reflection. I'm like, oh, wow, I actually have to think like through this quite critically and so on. And... And it's also what was interesting was like, you know, I got to like check in with what my, what my, what my desires were. So there was one thing of like what my actual prediction is, but what are my desires and could these desires be affecting my predictions and so on. And, you know, that's a, that's a method of rationality. And I personally don't think it loses anything in terms of, I, it didn't take any of the magic away from our relationship, quite the opposite. Like it brought us closer together because it was like, we did this weird fun thing um, that I appreciate a lot of people find quite strange. Um, and I think it was somewhat, you know, I, I, unique in our relationship that both of us are very, you know, we both love numbers. We both love statistics. We're both poker players. Um, so this this was kind of like our safe space anyway. For others, you know, one part one partner like really might not like that kind of stuff at all. In which case, this is not a good exercise to do. You know, I don't recommend it to everybody. Um, but I do think there's, you know, it's interesting sometimes to poke holes in the or you know probe at these things that we consider so sacred that we can't try to quantify them. But which is interesting because that's in tension with like the idea of what we just talked about with beauty and like what makes something beautiful, the fact that you can't measure everything about it. Um, and perhaps something shouldn't be tried to measure. You know, maybe it's wrong to completely try and value the utilitarian, you know, put a utilitarian frame of measuring the the, the utility of a tree in, in, in its entirety. I don't know. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. I'm, I'm ambivalent on that. But overall, people have too many biases that people are overly biased against trying to do like a, a quantified cost benefit analysis on really tough life decisions. Um, you know, they're like, oh, just go with your gut. It's like, well, sure, but guts, our, our, our intuitions are best suited for things that we've got tons of experience in. Then we can really, you know, trust on it if it's a decision we've made many times. But if it's like, should I marry this person or should I buy this house over that house? You only make those decisions a couple of times in your life. Maybe. Um. Well, I, I would love to know 
there's, there's a balance that probably is a personal balance to strike is the amount of rationality you, you apply to a question versus um, the useful fiction, mm -hmm. the fake it till you make it. For example, just talking to soldiers in Ukraine, you ask them, what's the probability of you winning, Ukraine winning? Um, almost everybody I talk to is 100%. Wow. And you listen to the experts, right? They, they, they say all kinds of stuff. Right. They are, they, first of all, the morale there is higher than probably, and I've, I've never been to a war zone before this, but I've read about many wars, and I think the morale in Ukraine is higher than almost anywhere I've read about. It's every single person in the country is proud to fight for their country. Wow. Uh, everybody, not just soldiers, not everybody. Why do you think that is specifically more than, you know, in other wars? Um, I think because there's a, perhaps a, a dormant desire for the citizens of this country to find the identity of this country because it's been mm. going through this 30 year process of different factions and political bickering. And they haven't had, as they talk about, they haven't had their independence war. They say all great nations have had an independence war. They had to fight for their independence, for the discovery of the identity, of the core of the ideals that unify us. And they haven't had that. There's constantly been factions, there's been divisions, there's been pressures from empires, from the United States and from Russia, from NATO and Europe, everybody telling them what to do. Now they wanna discover who they are. And there's that kind of sense that we're going to fight for the safety of our homeland, but we're also gonna fight for our identity. And that, um, uh, on top of the fact that there's just, if you look at the history of Ukraine, and there's certain other countries like this, there are certain cultures are feisty in their pride of being part, of being the citizens of that nation. Mm. Ukraine is that, Poland was that there's you just look at history in certain countries you do not want to occupy right <laughs> uh, I mean both Stalin and Hitler talked about Poland in this way they're like this is this is a big problem if we occupy this land for prolonged periods of time they're going to be a pain in their ass like they're not going to be want to be occupied and certain other countries are like pragmatic they're like well you know leaders come and go I guess mm. this is good you know they're Ukraine just doesn't have Ukrainians don't seem throughout the 20th century don't seem to be the kind of people that just like sit calmly and let the quote unquote occupiers um in in uh, impose their that that's uh, that's rules. interesting though because you said it's you know it's always been under conflict and leaders have come and yeah. gone yeah so you would expect them to actually be the opposite under that like yeah, reasoning I, because but, well because they're it's a very fertile land mm. it's great for agriculture right. so a lot of people want to i mean i think they've developed this culture because they've constantly been occupied by different people for the, the different peoples and so uh maybe there is something to that where you've constantly had to feel like within the blood of the generations there's this struggle for um against the man against the imposition of uh, rules against oppression and all that kind of stuff, and that stays with them. So there's a there's a will there, um, but you know a lot of other aspects are also part of that. That has to do with the reverse Moloch kind of situation where social media has definitely played a part of it. Um, also, different charismatic individuals have had to play a part. The fact that uh, the president of the nation Zelensky stayed in Kiev during the the invasion. Uh, was is a huge inspiration to them because um, most leaders, as you could imagine, when the capital of the nation is under attack, the wise thing, the smart thing that the United States advised Zelensky to do is to flee and to to be the leader of the nation from a from a distant place. Right. He said, "Fuck that! I'm staying put." You know, everyone around him there was a pressure to leave, and he didn't, and that that in you know, those singular acts um, really can unify a nation. There's a lot of people that criticize Zelensky within Ukraine. Uh, before the war, he was very unpopular, mm. even still. But they put that aside for the, for the, especially that singular act of staying in the capital. 
yeah, a, a lot of those kinds of things come together to 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 create something uh, within people. But these things always, of course, though, like the you know which. How zoomed out of a view do you want to take? Because yeah, you describe it. It's like an anti moloch thing happened within Ukraine because it brought the Ukrainian people together in order to fight a common enemy. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. In the end, we don't know how this is all going to play out, right? Um, but if you zoom it out from a level, you know, on a global level, they're coming together to, you know, fight that. That could, you know, that that could make a conflict larger. You, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know what the right answer is here. Um, yeah, I, it there's... seems like a good thing that they came together. I, but I like, we don't know how this is all going to play out. If if this all turns into nuclear war, we'll be like, okay, that was the bad. That was the. Oh yeah, so I was describing the the reverse Moloch for the local level. Exactly. Yeah. Now this is where the experts come in, and they say, well, if you. Uh, channel most of the resources of the nation and the nation supporting Ukraine into the war effort, are you not beating the drums of war that is much bigger than Ukraine? In fact, even the Ukrainian leaders are speaking uh, of it this way. This is not a war between two nations. This is this is the early days of a world war, if we don't play this correctly. Yes. Uh, and they, the, and we need cool heads from our leaders. So, you, from Ukraine's perspective, we need to win. Ukraine needs to win the war, because what does winning the war mean? Is coming up, coming to uh, peace negotiations, an agreement that guarantees no more invasions, and then you make an agreement about what land belongs to who, okay, right? And that that's you stop that, and and to sh basically from their perspective is you want to demonstrate to the rest of the world who's watching carefully, including Russia and China and different players on the geopolitical stage, that this kind of conflict is not going to be productive right? if you engage in it. So you wanna teach everybody a lesson, let's not do World War III. It's not. It's gonna be bad for everybody. It's a, it's a lose-lose. It's a deep lose-lose, uh, <laughs> doesn't but, matter. <laughs> so, but they, you know, uh, but it, and I think that's actually, a correct, uh, when I zoom out, I mean, 99% the, the of what I think about is just individual human beings and human lives and just that war is horrible. Mm -hmm. But when you zoom out and think from a geopolitics perspective, we should realize that it's entirely possible that we will see a World War III in the 21st century. And this is like a dress rehearsal for that. And so the way we play this, uh, as a as a human civilization, will will define whether we do or don't have a World War Three. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, how we discuss war, how we discuss nuclear war, the kind of leaders we we elect and uh, prop up, the kind of memes we circulate, because you have to be very careful when you're being. Uh, Pro Ukraine, for example, you have to realize that you're being, um, you are also indirectly feeding the ever increasing military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. So you have to be extremely careful that uh, when you say pro Ukraine or pro anybody, you're you're pro human beings, uh, not pro the machine. Exactly. That. Uh, that uh, creates narratives that says it's pro-human beings, but it's actually, if you look at the raw use of uh, funds and resources, it's actually pro-making weapons and shooting bullets and dropping bombs. Right, the real, we have to just somehow get the meme into everyone's heads that the real enemy is war itself. That's the enemy we need to defeat. And that doesn't mean to say that there, you know, there isn't justification for small local scenarios, you know, ad adversarial adversarial conflicts. You know, if you have a a leader who is starting wars, you know, they're on the side of team war. Basically, it's not that they're on the side of team country, whatever that country is. It's they're on the side of team war. So that needs to be stopped and put down. But you also have to find a ways that you're 
corrective measure doesn't actually then end up being co-opted by the war machine and creating greater war. Again, the playing field is fi finite. The scale of in conflict is now getting so big that the, you know the, the weapons that can be used are so mass destructive um, that we can't afford another giant conflict. We just we won't make it.